All right. Uh, this session is on big data law and analytics. Uh, my name is George Trianis. I'm a professor of law at uh, Stanford Law School. I'm also the associate dean of research for the university and uh, all, the director of a new cyber initiative that is a university-wide initiative here. Uh, I'm delighted to participate uh, as a, a moderator, even though I'm certainly far from an expert uh, compared to the people who are here on the, on, on the panel. Uh, I have to say, in 25 years of teaching, as I've gone around and asked uh, people who are non-lawyers, what do you admire most about lawyers? Uh, over the last 25 years, it hasn't been, uh, uh, shockingly, it hasn't been things like caution, or morality, or judgment, or knowledge of courts. It's really been, uh, what, what attracts the most admiration is the ability of lawyers to integrate, to process, to digest, to distill vast amounts of information. Whether it's legal information like case law, statutes, regulation that are complex, but it's also the ability of lawyers to be able to process and distill um, information of the, as to the facts of a case technical facts of cases that lawyers just seem to somehow, I don't know whether they're selected uh, for people uh, that are admitted to law school or whether the law school experience does that to people, but it's something that I've, I've noticed uh, keeps on coming up in conversations. So it's, it's only appropriate and important that when there are technological tools that help lawyers to become even better at digesting vast amounts of data. This is absolutely central and absolutely critical to the delivery of legal services, and not only within the profession, but outside of it as well. So we have, uh, we're blessed with six experts uh, on this panel, uh, we're all, but we're cursed with only one hour. So we have to be fairly uh, brutal in uh, proceeding. Uh, I just have to say, I, although I will ask each one of the panelists to introduce themselves, take about two or three minutes to introduce themselves, figuring that they know what is important about them better than I do, uh, I should say that it's an absolute de delight to welcome back uh, three uh, alumni from uh, Stanford Law School, Pablo, uh, Josh, and Daniel. Um, uh, the law school, thanks to a very large extent to uh, Codex and Roland Vogel and Michael Genezareth and their leadership that they've shown over a period of time, Stanford Law School really has been the hub and the font for, uh, the fount I should say, for a tremendous activity in the legal uh, tech world and it's only, as you might going to predict, become more active and more excitement is going to be generated as it spreads throughout uh, Stanford Law School. And they're not only the startups that have been generated that you are aware of from here, but they're also we, uh, our securities class action clearinghouse and there's a new uh, securities litigation analytics in Stanford Law School. So there's a lot of activity uh, in this space. Well, I said that we are scarce on time, so I'm not going to uh, uh, take any more of it, and I'd like to begin with Pablo uh, and go down the uh, line of these experts and ask them just to give us a two or three minute introduction. We'll go through some questions here on the panel and then open it up to questions uh, from you all. Thanks. All right. Uh, thank you, Professor Trandis, and thank you to Codex and uh, to our sponsors, uh, Thompson Reuters. Uh, an absolute privilege uh, to be here. Um, you know. Uh, I've heard it said that uh, James Watson, who discovered, you know, elucidated the structure of the double helix, would tell his grad students, never be the smartest person in the room because no one can help you. And as I look at the bios of my co-presenters and I've talked to some of you, I'm a little depressed at how successful I've been uh, at achieving that advice. Um, uh, I am a uh, fellow at the Stanford Center for Legal Informatics, Codex, and a uh, vice president at Case Text, uh, where, uh, which is a free legal research platform uh, looking to integrate uh, a wide variety of information uh, from the legal community into a legal research platform. Um, I might summarize uh, one aspect of my work, I think, would be to look at it not as natural language processing, but as judicial language processing. Um, and I think there's much that is unnatural about judicial language. Uh, the way I like to tell it is if you gave somebody the, the great Dickens classic and it began, it was the best of times, 485 US 127 comma 129, <laughs> But see, Jane versus Doe holding it was the worst of time, right? So, so uh, and, and those uh, weird things about judicial writing uh, can actually be leveraged uh, to great effect. Um, 
One example uh, is, and, and really for me, the, the issue is applying it. Uh, and application for me means one thing, which is building better legal research tools. And that's what we're trying to do about my case text. Uh, one example is a very short pattern, uh, let parenthesis H-O-L-D-I-N-G. Uh, now that parenthesis, if you threw it through sort of natural language, through all the newspaper articles, et cetera, wouldn't get you very much. If you run it on a corpus of judicial opinions, uh, you extract a database of about 700,000 case summaries written by judges, right? And so what we've done, one of the things we've done at Case Text is to pull out all of those case summaries and append them directly to the decisions that they're discussing. So uh, as, just as Westlaw will give you a sort of a summary of the holding written by their editors, we'll give you a summary of the holding written by different courts in different contexts. Um, and because decisions are rarely monolithic, um, it's sometimes useful to see how different courts in different contexts have summarized the holding, focusing on different aspects. But that's really just looking at the sort of very small, if you will, sort of genome. And I know genome is generally used to mean the big. Uh, and I know we have a bit of genomicist envy here in the legal informatics community. We like to talk about it. But really what we're doing with case text is to go much, much further and to look at, um, you could say the proteome, which is to say all the protein structures surrounding the genome, but I think it, I'd go further and just say the whole ecosystem, right? Um, if you take the entire legal community, the students, the professors, the lawyers, uh, the judges, every single person who is creating different forms of, uh, of content and information that is useful in different places, and much of it, of course, is freely available. Um, law firm client alerts that law firms send out to show their clients how on the ball they are, right? This is a great source of content that just sort of floats out there and is not leveraged. Uh, legal blogs, I think, which, you know, there's a spectrum. Some are not as good as others, but many of them are fantastic. Freely available, not being leveraged. So the analytics and the data science that we're doing is to say, let's look at the entire informatics of the law figure out the ways to match up relevant uh, secondary analysis and secondary materials to the primary materials and create a very robust, free legal research engine where not only do you get the primary materials like you would with Google Scholar, but you get a, a slew of very useful uh, analysis and content on the side. Thank you. Um, thanks. Thank you. Josh Becker. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's, uh, it is a real pleasure to be here. It's great to see this uh, conference grow over the years, so congratulations to Roland and the whole team. Um, I think, we're supposed to, uh, I think we talked about uh, you know, what sort of an insight behind our business. And I would say, you know, for us, uh, I'm CEO of Lex Machina. We provide legal analytics to lawyers at law firms and companies. And I'd say the fundamental insight was really before I got there, which was when it was still a public interest project uh, here at Stanford Law. And that was that openness and transparency is not only a good thing um, in law, but it's also possible. Um, that right now in law, we don't have openness and transparency. And in a sense, the way you think about it is really no one keeps score. Right? And if no one keeps score, you can't really have accountability. Um, and it's one of the reasons we do have uneven justice, which we have today. Um, and really the fundamental insight is that the data was out there. Uh, but you have to go through the millions of lawsuits a year, um, millions of pages of text. And, but if you could extract out the relevant data, uh, harness that data, and present it in a useful way, you could help lawyers be better lawyers. You could help judges be better justice. But, but judges be better judges and create more justice at the end of the day. And that's what we try to do, extract out that information and present it to folks so they can uh, improve what they do every day and get ultimately better outcomes. Thank you. Daniel Lewis. Thanks, George. Um, I'm the CEO of Ravel, and our story is, is super closely tied to Stanford because we started while I was a student here several years ago, and the first people that I reached out to were folks like Roland, and professors in the computer science department who were doing data visualization and data mining and machine learning. Because it felt like just a few years ago, there was a real gap between the technology that was available in the legal space and what was being developed and, and deployed everywhere else. And I think that started to change a lot and the conversations have gotten much more complex and much more nuanced. And this, this conference is a testament to that. But I think one of the things that we've tried to do is, is build technology that works in the gray areas to help smart lawyers be even better, to make more strategic data-driven decisions from complex information. Because while we, we sort of talk about the legal space and this panel is about big data, it's not big data in the traditional sense of a Google talks about it. It's relatively big data and it's big enough for the legal space that lawyers are no longer able to really wrap their arms around it and deal with all of this stuff like they could have 10 or 15 or 30 years ago. And so I think the, the technology that we're building is geared around 
uh, answering three questions. What is important? Why is it important? And how can you use it most effectively? And the way that we do that is through data analysis and data visualization. And it's a combination of, of trying to identify insights and patterns and trends to find remarkable information and major cases and major pieces of information, as well as needles in the haystack, things that would be overlooked and escape casual observation and intuition, and present that in a way that's intuitive and compelling and really in the form of a story. And for that, we use things like data visualization. And I think, you know, there's a lot of... Um, of discussion about, well, how do you get lawyers to adopt new technology? And I think part of it is making sure it's so easy and so compelling that they, they fall into it. And they, you sort of make this trap that they succeed in just by stumbling into it. And there will certainly be early adopters, and those folks will have a competitive advantage. And you can see that has happened in spaces that, like the law, consider themselves much more art than science. And Josh talks a lot about sports, and it's a great example. Um, Moneyball and what's gone on in baseball has transformed the game. And today, uh, in the last 10 years, eight out of the last 10 teams that won the World Series were using data analytics and relied on that as a core part of their strategy. 15 years ago, when Moneyball was introduced, it was transformative. And there was the sort of language that you hear in a revolutionary space where the old guard was saying, this is a... Uh, a travesty, it's changing the game, and it shouldn't be used, and a new guard saying that, you know, technology is the wave of the future, and it was a sort of either-or situation, and that's not the world that baseball is in today, and I think it's not the world that we want to be in in the law. The world of baseball today is focused on what's the right balance between technology and data and human instinct. How do you inform better decision-making with smart analysis and better statistics? And I think that's the same philosophy that we're trying to bring into the legal space, where how do you empower smart humans with better data to make better decisions? Um, so our team is composed of lawyers, designers, and computer scientists, some of whom um, we plucked right out of the, the departments here. Um, and it's a lot of fun trying to build an interdisciplinary approach to legal information. And I think that's what Codex also helps to foster here. Thank you. Um, Khalid al -Kofahi. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I head corporate R&D for Thomson Reuters, and uh, we do uh, applied uh, computer science research uh, from natural language processing. Actually, we, until a few years ago, we were mostly natural language processing shop. Um, and uh, you know, I started with, with Thomson, with WIST, actually with Thomson before WIST back in 1995. And, um, the, the, what I noticed about uh, the, the legal space is that it's not, uh, especially in a large corporation, we are not just, um, we don't just utilize technology, we advance the state of the art in technology. So the example that comes to mind when um, I started working on um, document classification, um, the state of the art uh, sort of data sets and the problems that people were working on are from Reuters, and this is before the merger between Thompson and Reuters, there were 13 news groups. Yeah. And when I started working in the legal space, uh, I was asked to work on classifying hidden of the key number system, 100,000 topics instead of 30. So um, imagine you know, what people were working on at the time, classifying documents to 30 topics versus classifying documents to 100,000 topics. And hence you know, the saying, uh, hair splitting, and lawyers are known for hair splitting. Um, but you know, moving from uh, document classification, natural language processing, and search, um, you know, a lot of the a lot of the tools that lawyers use today, for example, with Law Next, um, utilize uh, really remarkable technologies under the hood. And the fact that you know most people don't see them is, I sometimes think of it as a good thing. Um, hide the complexity of the system. And going forward, I think, you know, there is a lot more work that we are trying to do in the area of um, uh, establishing large-scale massive knowledge bases and allowing people to interact with these knowledge bases, not just, not just to find things that exist in these knowledge bases, but also to ask analytical questions of these knowledge bases, questions that require the system to compute and create an answer 
to, to retrieve the results. So this is, uh, to me, is, is one of the exciting area. Another uh, exciting area, and this is something that you know we are not working on at, at this point, but uh, uh, online uh, dispute resolution. I think that is uh, a massive area, you know, a very interesting area because it combines, it requires um, artificial intelligence and machine learning and at the same time, uh, domain expertise and lawyers and attorneys to be part of the process. So, um, you know, I look forward to uh, hopefully one day uh, working with some of you guys on, on, on that topic. Thank you, Khalid. Uh, Daniel Katz. Uh, yes, hi everyone, I'm, I'm Dan Katz. I, I currently teach at Michigan State University. Starting in about 60 days, I'll be teaching at Chicago Kent, Illinois Institute of Technology. I'm very excited about that opportunity. Uh, my background, um, I went to law school at the University of Michigan, and I got my PhD at Michigan, and probably the turning point for me is I, I did a fellowship at the Center for the Study of Complex Systems, which is kind of the Midwest version of the Santa Fe Institute, and, um, you know, that's an informatics and sociophysics house, and I saw, you know, having been in law, I saw a lot of the analog between what people were doing over there and what the possibilities might be in, over in law, and so... Um, so I've been teaching the last few years, uh, at, like I said, at Michigan State. Um, I'm an affiliated faculty member here at Stanford Codex. Uh, I'm a legal informatics researcher. Uh, I'm particularly interested in the application of predictive analytics to law, uh, both cases, contracts, and a whole range of other legal information, and trying to for forecast or predict. And so that's what I hope to talk a little bit about today. I teach uh, sort of a suite of legal technology classes um, in entrepreneurship. Uh, I have a consulting uh, a company with my friend Mike Bomarito, Josh Blackman, and a few others called Lex Predict LLC. I, one, I guess the focus of our, our thinking is that law looks like finance did 35 years ago. You know, sort of 40 years ago when Black Shoals, the first sort of trading models came on board. I mean, I, I remember I met one of these guys who said, you know, we went in to Goldman and said, you know, we could trade stocks with a computer. And they basically kicked them out of the room 40 years ago. Now, obviously, time was on their side, and so obviously timing on some of this is a good question, but I think, you know, if you think about the path from Black-Scholes to algorithmic trading, I think a lot of stuff in law really looks like finance. It's just dressed up with, like Oliver said at the beginning, and we have language constructs that are really standing in for other, other things, which really are methods to predict, the, it, rigorous methods to predict like, like exist in finance. So you wouldn't deploy a trading strategy unless you'd rigorously back-tested it, uh, so too, a lot of predictions that people are making are not rigorously backtested in the ways that they should be. And so, the que now saying that doesn't really help you unless you have some way to collect, aggregate, and build models, and that's some of what you know I do professionally. So I just wanted to uh, uh, hit me up on Twitter. I'm at computational on Twitter, which I'm very proud of. I beat all the computational <laughs> chemists. I beat the chemists and the biologists and everybody else. So I have, you know, as an early adopter on Twitter, I have at computational. So thank you. Thank you. Paul Lippe. Uh, I'm, I'm Paul Lippe. Uh, I won't I'll try not to do much of an introduction. I, I came to Silicon Valley in 1992 as a general counsel and then head of uh, business, corporate development for a, a computer-aided design automation company. So, so uh, and then I actually ran a medical informatics company for Stanford Medical School. So many of the, the, the conversation here, I've, I've had different touch points in my uh, journey, as they say. Um, I don't know if Oliver's in the room now, but I, we could save time. I could just say what he said. So I broadly agree with Oliver. Uh, perhaps our time frame is different. So what, what I want to do, uh, maybe in a, if I have time later, I'll tell you what our company does. But sort of having been in this conversation, I think, for a fairly substantial time, let me just sort of suggest that broadly there's a dichotomy or a tension point. So the, you know, call it what you want, the Silicon Valleyization of the world, the Stanfordization of the world, the transparencyization of which analytics is, is a profound expression, clearly seems to be the strong force in the universe. On the other hand, we have uh, what we might call the culture of law and legal problem solving, which is very individualistic, privileges the, the personal thought processes, values very highly the intentions of the thinker as opposed to the outcomes. And so there's a very... Uh, a very strong tension. I see many friends from law firms in the room who are all sitting thinking, God, when I go back to the law firm and tell them what these people said, they're going to think I'm crazy. So uh, given that tension, let me make a couple of predictions about how analytics will play out in law. So, um, and, you know, every, every uh, rule has an exception. So first, 
Uh, analytics will be most relevant to solve big problems that are otherwise unsolvable, problems of complexity like resolution planning, not so much uh, improving the productivity of individual lawyers. Uh, Josh's company is probably an exception to that. They're going to do fabulously well in the traditional market, but as a whole, analytics will do better. And this is, you know, sort of Jeffrey Moore 101 stuff. Analytics will do better solving problems that aren't otherwise solvable. Uh, number two, to borrow from far and away the smartest person in this room, Carl Chapman, who says legal input, business output, <coughs> business outcome. What, what did I say? What did you say? What's your card? Legal input, business output. The, the consumers of analytic data will not be lawyers. They'll be the, the lawyer's customer, the customer's customer. And they'll be the ones to transform uh, things. Three, once the analytics is in place, it will become apparent how much complexity we have in the system that's not useful. And so at some point, we'll reach a kind of a, a tipping point. And of course, we're all you know, believers in tipping points. But at some point, it becomes so apparent that the, the com today's complex structures are actually counterproductive to big goals like access to justice. Um, and then finally, the lens for much of this will design is, I mean, analytics is great, but the lens will actually be design. I don't know if Margaret's here, but, but the, most, you know, the most consequential work is the cross-functional work that's happening in, in universities between legal uh, department or <laughs> law schools and other teams and the lens of design of what problem are we really trying to solve and what do we need to solve that problem. And when that's all done, as, as he said, Oliver, uh, law will be increasingly embedded in other, in, in societal and business processes. It'll be less and less seen as a distinct problem-solving domain, and that will broadly be a good thing. Thanks. So um, I'm glad you mentioned Oliver because uh, he, he gave really a tour de force to, to start us off with a combination, a heavy uh, responsibility of doing a sort of a general where has uh, legal technology been and where is it going, and then a deeper dive into computational uh, uh, law. But um, from the perspective of someone who is more deeply uh, focused on uh, data science and data analytics and law, um, how does that path, uh, whether you want to use the 1.0 to 3.0, how does that path look from that perspective as opposed to from the computational perspective? And let me ask Dan Katz to, to begin. Well, I, um, I think that Oliver and I are in broad agreement. Um, the hard implementation question is, is how to map those states when you get to increasingly complex objects. Now, like Paul said, some of the complexity we're going to find out really serves no purpose, um, but some of it does. I mean, one thing I was thinking a lot about was, you know, like in AI, of course, there's the big divide between rules-based AI and data-driven AI, and you'll see some of that on display here today. And, I, and you know, I'm more of a data-driven person. That's why I'm on this particular panel. But I think, you know, what we need to do is figure out how to map these things. If you look at a lot of the problems and how they're solved, it's I'm trying to instantiate the rules that, that things are using, but I need to use data to probably map that state space that the one that, you know, um, Oliver had up there as we move to increasingly complex contracts. And so that, you know, it's a, it's, it, there's a real tension there. So just like classic examples of this are like, you know, um, you could try to build a spell checker using the rule, write down the rules of spelling, or you could use a billion clicks. And so the tension is, is what am I trying to use the billion clicks to do? Learn the rules or back out the rules. And so it's this sort of tension is, do I write down the rules of spelling or do I, do I watch a bunch of people drive cars or, or do I try to write down the rules of driving? No, I try to back out the rules of driving. I mean, this is kind of the tension. We're trying to, write, we're trying to learn the rules, but where do we learn the rules from? We, we learn them from the data. And so I do think this data panel, kind of if we really want to go into that 3.0 mode, um, the data is going to be a big part of the implementation necessary to actually map what is previous, what you otherwise is kind of an infinite state space. Like there's an infinite set of states that a contract in principle could take on. What you'll see in the data is that it's a, you know, it's a sparse matrix to say the least. Does anybody else on the panel want to sort of reflect on, on this just, question? Maybe just to add to that, I mean, totally agree with Dan. If, if we have infinite amounts of data, I don't think we need any rules or domain expertise. We can learn everything. But we don't have infinite amounts of data. We have limited <coughs> amounts of data. And as you move from one uh, uh, type of contract or one problem to, an, to the next, it will be extre extremely more difficult to really formalize these rules, if not impossible. Just imagine if anyone in this room wants to write 
a rule that describes how an A for hand recognition, how an A looks like. Is it this? Is it a circle? Is it? It's impossible to enumerate all the possibilities. So somehow we need to um, write rules that are granular enough to provide directions for data and use uh, machine learning and, and, and data analytics to learn the, the fine uh, details of the model. Thank you. Um, I, I'm curious to, to learn, especially from, from uh, Pablo, Josh, and, and Daniel, how the, how the market has changed for your products over the last two, three years, and where you see it evolving over the, na the next two, three, five years. Well, maybe I can start, because we've... Uh, uh, so when Lex Machina spun out of Stanford, um, you know, uh, the story goes that, you know, they didn't even use the word data, right? And so it was a kind of afraid to use the data and analytics term. It's like, we're selling history, you know, we're, we're not selling data. And, and, so, um, and so I think the evolution that we've seen is kind of from that moment to really the embrace of, of data and analytics um, in many firms. And, you know, many times it started classically with uh, one early adopter at a firm, uh, a few early adopters. Um, but I think we've certainly seen, you know, that kind of crossing the chasm uh, moment um, where, you know, the use cases are widely understood. And, and I think that's really been the key, right, for people to understand, okay, how does this help me craft a better motion? You know, how does this help me uh, research, you know, you know, figure out my, my litigation strategy better and understand the opposing party better or, or understand the opposing uh, lawyer better? Um, I think that is really what we've seen over the last few years. And I think it's for, you know, a number of reasons. I think. It's the technology getting better, um, our product getting better, user interface getting better, um, uh, you know, new products coming to the market, just more acceptance of this generally, um, uh, you know, a, as well as um, other factors like increased competition at, at law firms, say, where there's increased competition for business and looking for that edge, um, as well as also a generational, you know, transition in law firms themselves, where, you know, if you make partner today, you were at college, you know, you were using Google in college, right? So you have a different expectation of technology. You know, then my father, who was a law professor for 40 years, and, you know, they had to rip WordPerfect out of his hands, you know, uh, at the end of the day. Um, so you have a kind of different expectation. So I think we we're really, I mean, still with the, I think, early days, but I think we're fundamentally seeing the, that transition where the market is more accepting, is ready, the products are getting better and more of them, and, um, and so it's a really exciting time. I mean, I, I think also, along with the market, I think just looking at how the profession does legal research um, is, is, is perhaps in some ways more useful in terms of looking at the actual tools that are being used. And uh, the trends tend to be, well, there's a couple of trends. One, unfortunately, is that uh, law firms are not very happy with the associates as they arrive with their legal research abilities. Uh, and increasingly, um, as, as Josh alluded to, there's a the sense that, well, I'll start with Google. Um, and I think um, uh, Susan neville mart uh, did a study uh, with the ABA and found that often uh, that's what lawyers do now. They just start with Google, and so they're thrown into that internet uh, space. Um, to the extent that what we're trying to do with, uh, with case text is sort of to say, well, let's bring some order to that same desire to have free access to the community's wisdom, right? I think that uh, the, the time is ripe to sort of do that, because the, the, the fear is they're kind of doing that anyway um, without as much structure. Um, and so I think that, uh, uh, th th that's the, the major uh, drive, I would say, is sort of the, the, the use of the community's wisdom has now become something that everyone expects to do, and let's try to do it in as professional a way as possible, and I think it starts with legal research education, uh, and then it starts with designing a platform that lets the community uh, police itself to a certain extent, um, and uh, uh, that's what I would say. You know, George, it's interesting. We've heard conversations shift a lot in the last three years. And when we were first sort of out there beta testing with folks in 2012, you'd get questions about like, what was the cloud and what was uh, your security policy and the security questions they asked you had clearly been downloaded from some generic Google search. Um, and the nuance and understanding of these things that we're talking about of what is cloud software and uh, what is machine learning? People are starting to hear these firms and get much more familiar with them. But e even with own, my own family, I've seen the generational differences. So I come from a family of attorneys. Both my parents are lawyers. My older brother is now a fifth year associate. My younger brother is taking Crim Pro in one of the classrooms over there. <laughs> and my parents say, oh, this Ravel thing is really cool. Don't really get it. Uh, my older brother kind of gets it. And my younger brother uses it all the time. 
So you see that happening in law schools where last year we had, you know, 10 different student reps on campuses around the country. This year we have nearly 50. And the uptake with students is extraordinary because they are coming in, they're the latest generation, they have the highest expectations of technology, as Josh said. And those folks, at least in our space, of the research space, they do it super intensively for about four or five years in school and then at a firm and then, and then they graduate out of it, so to speak. Um, and so when you have that quick of a turnover, it's really a boon to companies like ours because we get to take advantage of um, people who have high expectations about what technology can do for them. So you could always wait for the generations to change, but surely that's not what you want to do. That's not your, your strategy. So uh, in particular, with respect to the law firm market, what's your, what's your hook? Where, where is the easiest point of entry uh, in law firms in introducing them to uh, data and analytics? Well, see, in our case, that's pretty clear because, you know, I mentioned sort of the, the kind of increased competition, and, and I think that's been one of the trends has been widely recognized is after the financial crisis, um, folks in-house kind of started to have kind of more power and kind of different and to kind of wield it a little bit more in, in terms of what they were looking for in the representation and also their expectation of, you know, more transparency in terms of costs and timelines and things like that. And so for us, one of the real hooks into law firms is, hey, it helps you win more cases. So you data analytics, you can compare yourself, you can say, hey, listen, you know, we have more experience in front of this judge than folks I know you typically use, or, you know, we have faster time to trial, or um, we have better results. Um, so data becomes, and I think ultimately that becomes, you know, just standard, but for now it's a competitive advantage for folks to be able to use data and to win business and get cases, which are, you know, in a litigation context are, you know, substantial revenue to the firm. So that's generally the way in. Once they, it's actually in a firm, then um, the vast majority of use cases are actually the case strategy use cases themselves, where they're using it to craft a better motion, to research the opposing party, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but that's often a way in. And, you know, for, for us, you know, contacting law firms and saying, hey, please add your wonderful content to this magnificent thing that we're building, um, some of them respond to that often, though, the question is, do I need to do anything? And the answer is no. And they say, is it free? And we say yes. And they go, oh, all right. You know, that. <laughs> so uh, we find that requiring no effort and no payment is a very useful way <laughs> to approach law firms. And, of course, then when they see their, their content next in the margin of this case, they really respond positively. So um, I think for us that's been very cool. So if we look forward five years from now, and we were, and we were uh, then assessing at that time what's been the biggest change, uh, it sounds like the market or the uses, are, or the users and uses are going to be the, what we're going to talk the most about rather than technology, or what do you anticipate as being significant innovations in the technology itself? Anybody oh, on boy. the panel? Oh, man, I mean, there's... So many fun things well, to talk about there. <laughs> so, yeah, I think it's probably useful to distinguish between the production function of legal work and the consumption of legal work. And, and the law school the lawyer community remains dominantly concerned in the production function. Uh, I would make a broad assertion that almost all legal work is overwhelmingly similar to legal work that already exists, and therefore uh, uh, an orientation to the production function that it's all unique has some, has some problems with it. Um, so we've, on the production side, we've kind of looked at uh, both sort of massive collaboration. We have a bridge to practice program. We deploy large numbers of young lawyers. And then now we're using machine learning and IBM uh, Watson technology. I think we're the first Watson users in law. So you'll see uh, in all fields, so everybody knows what Moore's Law is. And um, in the mid-90s, John Doerr called, coined Moron's Law, which was when they when he started doing internet companies, they could never get the phone companies and the cable companies to ever do anything. So he said, this, these guys are all morons, uh, morons law. So I, I will, I will uh, coin Lippi's law, which is the state of legal production is so obviously behind production in all of the fields that all innovations look like they're radically better than the status quo. But that doesn't mean that they'll all prove to be uh, transformational or even uh, successful ventures. So on the production side, there are new, you know, there'll be lots of new technologies. But I, I think the more interesting thing will really be on the consumption side. I, I, I think Khalid is in a, you know, if I were as an investor, I would invest in Khalid and not some of the other legal research companies because they're a mul they serve multiple verticals, including finance, which is the primary consumer of legal work products. So 
uh, just a quick, so Dan and I wrote an article uh, which is being published in a you know, moderately uh, posh law review. I'm pretty sure that no one in the history of the universe will ever read this article except perhaps his family. And, yeah. and, uh, if I pay them. And somebody. Yeah. <laughs> uh, then we then had the opportunity to create a, you know, a more, whatever, commercial version, more popular version for a banking industry journal. And I think that will have a powerful impact because it will describe for people in the banking industry how they can do law better to, to solve a problem. And, and the, so the whole law and uh, is really where things are going because by definition, law isn't a discrete system, it's a system connected with other things. So the more we focus exclusively on the production function, uh, the, the, the less easy it is to get to that law and place, which is I think, and again, as, like he said, uh, Oliver, yeah. I'd also like to, uh, we'll continue discussing here, but invite anybody who's got questions to go to one of the uh, mics. We'd like to open it up uh, uh, soon. Do you want to head over to a mic and, uh, so that it can also be recorded? Um, anybody else on the panel want to comment? Yeah, while, while we are waiting, I'll just add uh, uh, just a small story about, you know, the role, you know, how we can do data analysis and, and, and analytics to understand um, contracts in this, in this particular example in a different way. So we started uh, you know, a few years back, and, and this is one of the things I like about my job. We get to work on things that are not necessarily uh, uh, justifiable from a business sense, at least not early on. Um, we, we started looking at EOLAs, end user license agreements, especially in the so software EOLAs. And the idea was, can we build a system that estimate the risk of EOLs? We all you know, face EOLs, nobody reads them. Maybe some people in this audience reads them. I don't, and if I read them, I don't understand them. Uh, so, but we need lots of data, back to the data problem. So we switched to contracts and SEC filings, yeah, which are not contracts, but similar. You know, the text part to SEC filings. And the idea was, can we train a machine to read clauses and contracts and assess the risk in a contract or assess the risk in an SEC filing? And the answer was yes. And uh, you know, um, in, in for contracts, we, we developed a machine that uh, analyzed about 200 million clauses, and then uh, we um, and asked uh, a group of attorneys to assess the risk in a set of uh, contracts, and we asked the machine to assess the same, uh, analyze the same contracts, and the correlation was about 94%. Uh, for SEC filings, uh, we, we have it in beta right now. The idea was, you know, companies who um, are going through turbulent times uh, try to hide the risks in um, uh, boilerplate language or in abnormal language. They are not consistent with themselves and their peers. And if we, can we detect that abnormality? And to prove the point, can we do um, a simple trading strategy? Companies that are abnormal in their filings go short. Uh, how much money do we make? And we made about 300% in five years. Uh, very volatile, not for the vintage heart, so you, know, you can't trade on it really. But you know, the point is there is a significant signal and I think technology can help. Just one other kind of quick point. Um, you know, because the question whether is technology driving it or the market driving it, I think, you know, obviously the technology is getting better, but I think, uh, and this was a conference I was at last week that Ralph Baxter shared, the point was really made that it's really the market driving the technology. And I think it's a, back to what Paul said, you know, it's the corporate user at the end of the day who's kind of driving this, and it's really their expectations and their demands in some cases, um, and that's, that's really, and, you know, again, and the... The, the project that, that became Lex Machina was funded initially by companies looking for this kind of information about, particularly in patent law, you know, who are, who are suing me, right? Who's the best counsel? What's happening? You know, who's this judge in the Eastern District, right? So I, I think while technology's got, technology is getting better, in many cases, it really, it really is the market driving. Thank and you. I think, Matt, one thing, I think there's so many different innovations you can do when you start to leverage an entire community of attorneys. Um, and, keeping in the vein of sort of let's look at what can be done with very little effort, right? We are all familiar with the Facebook like button, right? And we have an, an upvote button. You can imagine uh, organizations, let's say an organization that they all represent uh, uh, landlords in disputes, right? And they can just say like to certain cases. 
uh, and then an organization that represents only tenants, and they can say, like, to cases they like, you now have enabled a fantastic way to rank cases based on tenant versus landlord friendliness. Now, and I think all of you in your various areas of law would love if suddenly on Westlaw you saw this thing that said filter based on my client or the other guy's client, right? So that's just one example with just one click and people just doing their small little contributions where you can have uh, fantastic sophistication and nuance. Um, and I think each community is going to know things that they want for their own community um, better than one centralized uh, company might. Um, and so that's all the more reason, I think, to power and empower you guys. Thank you for waiting. Question. Yeah, so just uh, picking up on Josh's question. Can you identify you yourself? Class. Question. Can the questioners identify themselves? Oh, yes. My name is uh, Nick Barnes. I'm a venture capitalist. Um, economic lens on this discussion and picking up on something that Josh mentioned. If you think about unique problems that data computational power, machine learning, and predictive analytics can solve and law, what are the economically most valuable ones? The ones we're working on. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I'll, point, I'll point out two of them if I could. I mean, uh, uh, so I mentioned this law is finance idea, so I'll just give you an example of a paper I'm going to release here in the next couple of weeks. Uh, you can build a trading strategy. If you can predict the votes of justices on the Supreme Court, there's 80 tradable events in the last 15 years. So you can build a, market, a trading strategy against the decision if you know that, you know, with the best model possible. So that's like an example where it's not about, and this is the problem, right, is that the lawyers have such a law-centric view of the world. That's a law and finance sort of move. And then some of the stuff with Paul, you know, resolution recovery planning, that's a law and accounting and um, regulatory sort of, you know, working in a regula regu heavily regulated environment. I mean, the idea of a bank uh, one of the SIFIs trying to create a will. We don't really have a roadmap for doing a will at a, institutions of those of that scale and complexity. We're, and then to try to do, on top of having the will, then you have to try to show, hey, we're robust against a set of you know, possible failures of our counterparties. I mean, we have a bankruptcy construct. That's, a, that's after something that's already gone south, of, but this is to try to do a counterfactual or hypothetical bankruptcy. That's, again, one of these places where an taking contracts that are sitting in all these organizations, turning them into data so that you can actually engage in the simulation exercise is a problem of enormous complexity. But it, it's a great problem because it's not as though the existing methods, I mean, the, all the banks have had their plans rejected by the government, and so it's just a kind of brand new problem in law, and, and, and existing tools don't work, so it's actually some, an opportunity for people who have a different way to actually have an have entree because they can't just go and say, well, let's do what we've always done. I just point, I wanted to point that out. You know, that's a high value problem and a high complexity problem and one that existing methods don't work. Thank you. And I, I know what you said, I think there's those, those kind of new opportunities that Dan talked about, but I mean, I think we believe, and, and, and maybe my uh, folks here agree, you know, it's really, I think the biggest economic opportunity is just letting uh, folks do what they do today, but better, right? Just improving, um, uh, in, improving how they do their jobs, giving them additional data to help them do it better and more efficiently. Thank you. My colleague, Deborah Hensler. Thanks, George. Um, so in this conversation, no one has spoken specifically about uh, territoriality or juris uh, jurisdiction, but I'm, I'm inferring that most of your operations in terms of building databases, et cetera, are domestically oriented. And so I'm curious if um, any of you are thinking of the global market, the multinational company that actually needs to know the rules that would affect its transaction that is about to take place in 10 different countries affected by domestic law, EU law, maybe the law of some Asian jurisdiction. Um, so that would be a, a market change rather than a technology change. But I'm curious as to whether any of these initiatives have a global perspective. Oh, sorry. So I was in Korea last week, and do you think, you know, who are the entities that are most sued in the U.S.? Well, we just came out with the report. Um, <laughs> Samsung, LG, um, and, um, you know, Samsung, there are three different entities, essentially, in the top ten. Um, and so, of course, they're very interested in what's going on in IP law in the U.S. 
Um, and what are the trends, what's happening, you know, what's the trends in lawsuits and damages and judgments, and providing that kind of transparency and the point we made to, and to Korean law firms as well, you can have as much insight now into what's going on in IP law up to the minute really, up to, you know, last night, um, you know, as someone sitting here in Silicon Valley or New York. So um, I think that's one dimension, how technology and transparency uh, can help. And I would say, you know, we have a, a fairly large, growing uh, international law community. Um, we haven't put up as many international law materials as we might, but certainly the same approach would work globally, obviously, of integrating the community. And as to small patterns in the common law that might be leveraged, uh, one of the ones I was actually interested in is the, the, the words, it is well settled and it is well established, um, which if you use that as a probe, you can pull out hundreds of thousands of uh, legal principles. And actually, you can chase that phrase back in Canada, it shows up, it shows up in Australia, um, and it goes back to England so far back that it's like an F, like it is well fettled, it almost looks like an F anyway. <laughs> so uh, I, I think that uh, it's using, leveraging patterns in the judicial opinions is maybe less applicable as you get into different systems. But I believe each system will have its own patterns that you can then, if you look for them and find them, can use to create similar things. I think that's true, and right. I think that there is a real growth Introduce yourself, oh, please. Yeah, uh, Sidney Pradhan, I'm a graduate student at the Computer Science Department here at Stanford. Uh, and one question I have was you guys mentioned that a lot of projects for the isn't necessarily technology as it is with expanding markets. So, one question I was wondering about is is there a credibility problem here? Like, you mentioned, uh, you mentioned about Black Shoals and the rise of quantitative finance, but there everything was numbers based, and so you had some ways of showing banks and showing investors, hey, here's the test that shows what we're doing. You mentioned that there were some aspects of this that you could incorporate showing, you know, we can improve the number of law cases you run. But I'm thinking in terms of things that are not as inherently quantifiable, like the con like contracts that say, hey, this is beneficial to you or this is beneficial to your opponent, how do you overcome some of those credibility issues when trying to get companies to adopt these, uh, these methods? That's a good question. One quick thing I'll say. Although I, I was remarking earlier that I've never seen an area of entrepreneurship, and, um, and I've been doing convincing entrepreneurship for a while, you know, as collaborative as, as law, and, um, and I really think we all root for each other, and, and uh, it makes it a lot of fun. But I will say, we will hire you before uh, these guys, so, <laughs> so uh, I should make that. But Dan's probably best so this, to answer this. I, I have to, you know, I, I, you got to do the, lean, the Bill Clinton lean forward and share the intimate moment with 400 strangers thing. Um, so I, for me, this is like an intensely bizarre emotional experience because uh, I, I've been in, in this conversation for a while, so just very concretely, I think about five years ago I was invited to speak to the Canadian Bar Association in Toronto and I sort of ticked through my little spiel about how all the things that people think are new in the world, um, the, the most advanced knowledge structures were in law 50 years ago. You know, Martindale Hubble was 130 years ahead of LinkedIn. and and. Uh, Thomas uh, West Keysights was ahead of a bunch of things, and and shepherdizing anticipated the link structure of the web. So somehow lawyers forgot over the last 30 or 40 years that we're pretty good at this stuff, which is why we have a credibility problem. Anyway, in the course of this talk in, in the CBA, I finally said, how many people know what Twitter is? And about eight hands reluctantly went up. And I said, how many of you tweet? And, and two people hands went up and I happened to know who they were and they were farthest. So I said, so let me show you guys, gals, what's going on. So I, I just pulled up the Twitter stream from uh, the two people who were tweeting the meeting and they probably did a better job of explaining whatever it, my bloviation was than I did. And everybody was like, oh, shocked. So, so now I'm sitting here, like 40 people are tweeting and it's not even, a con you know, it's not even imaginable that we wouldn't have people real time video conferencing in from wherever they are and filming this thing on iPhone. So hello to our robot hello, presences hello out to, there. Hello, yes. Hi Greg. To the MIT wormhole and the 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 I school at Harvard. So so the world has changed radically. The perception of lawyers lags that somewhat and you know we could talk about why that is. But it's a it's a non question. The the credibility will come as people demonstrate how these things work. They won't all work. They won't all work exactly as predicted and, and you know, you'll just have, you have to pick whether you want to work for Josh or one of these other guys. I'd work for Josh because I think he's delightful, but if you, yeah, I'm sure it's a win either way. But if you build things that work, you'll have credibility. If you just sit around and, you, gotta, you know, 
yap, then you won't have as much credibility, right? We have time for one more question, but before we get to that, let me just remind you that there is an evaluation that we would like very much for you to fill of every uh, session. So if you can take a break from your tweeting at some point uh, today <laughs> and fill out this old-fashioned uh, paper form of evaluation, it would be much appreciated. Last question. Hey, guys. Hey. It's uh, Eddie from Uh You know, I, I, first of all, amazing panel, really. Such leaders of the field all brought together in one place. And I've been following four of you for years in the way that I followed baseball players when I was a kid. Uh, it's really exciting. Um, well, you got their attention. Yeah, and they know it. I'll ask the question though. You, you've already described how the innovative work you're doing will no doubt revolutionize legal services mediated by the lawyer. What about legal services directly to a consumer? And I don't mean a bank that has a general counsel. What about directly? To Seems a like they need legal Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> we love you, Paul. Thank you. <laughs> so yeah, so um, there's a vast. Uh, there was a conference in Georgetown last week about changing the regulatory structure. They just sent me in, and my friend from Washington I had dinner with. I'll forward it to. You've got Carl Chapman here, who's the first ABS firm in the UK. So the UK has change the regulatory structure in a way that the U.S. inevitably will. Are we two years away or 15 years away? You know, no predictions. And so, the, but as, again, like he said, Oliver, at the end of the day, the A to J problem is, is owned by state Supreme Court justices who recognize the status quo is intolerable. And so as the state bars challenge what you guys are doing, they will lose every time, and the judiciary will over time intervene to allow legal access through multiple, you know, multi-tier model, which you guys will be the leader of, along with one or two other companies, and that's what's desperately needed, and and that's what people in law schools, who to a man and woman professor would say, are passionately care about uh, the uh, the access to justice should be totally focused on how do we address the regulatory impediments to access to justice to use different technologies and services to facilitate that. Uh, we didn't coordinate this, but how did I do? Did I do okay in terms of answering? <laughs> yeah, you did grab it earlier you. when you said, you know, most law that's being done is similar to law that was already done. Wow. Maybe uh, Daniel's brother, the youngest one, right, uh, if he doesn't decide to become a lawyer, will say, you know what, I, I can just use one of your technologies to get the answer that I needed with the same certainty as going to a lawyer. Do you see that as a possibility? Is that something that anyone is thinking about bringing to market? Anybody else? I mean, absolutely. So when Jake, our founder and CEO, formed the company, the guiding mission was the law should be free and understandable for all. And I remember when I first was hanging out, I was like, by all, you mean like patent litigators, right? You don't really mean <laughs> everybody. Do you? And Jake was like, no, 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 I mean everybody. Uh, and you know, I, I began the panel by pointing out that there's a lot that's unnatural about legal language. Um, and when you create a free common law database that everyone can access, I think the ultimate challenge, or one of the big challenges, is going to be to create another layer of analysis that will help people understand the law that governs them to a certain extent. Um, and I think the, the challenge is to do that concurrently with dealing with the fact that attorneys are the ones that are most often using our system and things like that. So, but in the long run, absolutely, I think there's a strong need for a system that helps the average citizen who wants to spend the time actually engaging in the common law to understand what's going on and to put that into perspective. Yeah, Eddie, we, uh, we hired somebody from Texas and when he said, look, you need to start in two weeks, he like frantically tried to get out of his lease and his landlord claimed that he owed a security deposit and he went on to Ravel and found information and like took a case back to the landlord and ended up getting paid by the landlord. So I, I think, you know, legal information is extremely complex. It's confusing to lawyers, but through the processes like Pablo's talking about of, uh, and the Ravel's focused on of trying to make it more intelligent, not just for lawyers, but I think there will be benefits that shake out for people who are interested in the law and uh, today find it not only unaccessible, but confusing when they do find it. Um, there will be gains and benefits for making this information much more intuitive and understandable. Thank you for the question. Yeah, Please. Thank you, guys. I'm rooting for all of you in a huge way. So excited. <laughs> thank you. All right. Please join me in thanking the panelists for a very engaging session.